Hi, everyone. My name is Kirk Bachman, and welcome back to The Ultimate Dish. In today's episode, we're speaking with John Bogosian, an entrepreneur and former CEO of ZingFit, a software platform designed to help boutique fitness studios manage their business. John's past entrepreneurial ventures include online retail software, in-store organic grocery, digital marketing consulting, content management software, and a Wall Street food delivery service. In his spare time, John is also an educator, musician, avid cook, and hockey player. Join us today as we chat with John about health and wellness, education, tech, family, and food entrepreneurship. Bogo, welcome, John. How are you doing, buddy? (laughs) Hey, Kirk, how are you? I'm doing great. Good morning. Good morning. I am I I am so excited. I like the set there. Looks really really comfortable. If you yeah. if if you want to play a few bars a little bit later, I'm I'm, I'm totally cool with that, huh? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I'll uh, it, it, maybe I'll sing a few too. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> let's not get carried away. Okay. <laughs> hey, I have to say I am super. First of all, I'm super super excited to have you here this morning. We've been talking about doing this for a long time, and I am super super amped up still. Uh, you know, my wife, Gretchen and I, we went up to, uh, Red Rocks last night to see Nathaniel Radcliffe. And it was, it was wonderful. It was, it was at first a little overwhelming. It's like, I don't think I've been out in, in the last 18 months. Uh, but it was kind of beautiful to see so many people together, enjoying music, enjoying each other. And we're going to talk music today. Um, my ears are still ringing a little bit, but it was really cool. It was <laughs> and really enjoying cool. all that with the uh, with, with a good scenery last night. Did you get some yeah. sunset? Yeah, uh, big big full moon, the whole bit. It was an amazing uh, place. It, it was really yeah. Oh, it was really moon. something nice. Yeah, it was perfect, just perfect. Yeah. Hey, but let's let let's talk about you. You you are just back with the family from a what was it a six week tour of the United States or something like that? <laughs> yeah, from the view of a trailer. <laughs> well you call it a trailer but you know i bet it was it was a it was a, 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 a travel trailer yeah. a travel trailer a travel there you trailer, go yeah other, yeah, yeah. so where, where did you go that. where did you guys go um so so we're here in colorado we went um kind of all the way to um newport rhode island which is as far east as you could possibly go i think wow maybe, yeah maybe the cape is a little further yeah um but um and then headed back you know we saw some family there so a bunch of relatives and friends, you know, that we left behind on the coast there and, um, you know, saw some, saw some caves on the way and, you know, uh, swam in Lake Michigan, you know, all, all, all the oh, nice, big highlights. Nice. Trying to get How about any, the kids. any new discoveries? Uh, was this the first time with the, with the kids, um, to go across the country like that? Um, yeah. I mean, we literally got the camper delivered, you know, a week before we took off. So it's really, <laughs> really brand new and, and high adventure. <laughs> what, what, what cool discoveries along the way, particularly around food, anything? Um, I mean, we've been shut down for a long time, so it was probably fascinating, huh? Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I guess, um, uh, you know, truck stop food is as, <laughs> as bad as you expect. That was, okay. You know, consistent. All sorts of uh, kind of, gourmet experiences with microwave ovens and uh okay and some okay. of the truck stops and, and and they loved it by the way yeah well it was fun it was different for them right it was yeah. different so i called you bogo at the beginning let's tell our our, our audience where that comes from is that's a is that a um, college nickname or is that a a lifelong nickname um that goes uh that goes back a few generations actually you know so my last name is bogosian right okay and so bogo yeah, so if we get into the etymology, you know, so Bogos is is Paul in Armenian, so son of Paul. Okay. And, okay. Um, yeah, people have been saying, you know, hey Bogo to my grandfather, to my dad. Um, my Isn't brother, that something? My brother and I both went to Wesleyan, both played on the hockey team, and so he was Bogo one, and I was Bogo two for a while. And okay. So I finally <laughs> laughed, and I finally got the mantle of just Bogo. Yeah. No, I love, I love it. Talk about hockey a little bit. It's a, that's a real passion for you, right? You play it in grade school, high school, college, the whole bit, right? Yeah. That's another thing that kind of goes back, um, you know, some generations in my family. I mean, you know, Rhode Island where I'm from is, uh, you know, there's a lot of water there and all the lakes froze and that's just what everyone did. Everyone just 
uh, played hockey. I yeah. Don't know, probably, probably four months a year. Everyone would just go and skate. And my mom met my dad uh, on the ice, actually. They, oh, neat. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they threw her in the net and <laughs> 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 he used to, used to skate with her, with her big brother. And, um, so I started, you know, when I was two and, uh, you know, went on and played hockey at Westland and my sister played, my mom started, started a, um, a, a girls ice hockey league in Rhode Island. You know, my dad coached. Oh, wow. Me. I did not was, know that. Wow. Yeah. So it was a real family affair. Yeah. Is that it? So hockey, I mean, super competitive team sport. Is that where some of your, your drive Aggression. comes from? What? <laughs> Your recklessness. Go ahead. Say it, Kirk. <laughs> Is that why you're out? <laughs> but but I, I I mean you're you're very you're competitive you're entrepreneurial and uh, you you know does it have some roots in uh, in 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 your participation in sports? Um, I mean I imagine so. You know there's something about you know kind of growing up in a in a blue collar world you know which just makes you a little scrappy right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, interestingly, the, you know, when I graduated school, um, you know, I got, you know, a few interviews uh, down at Wall Street. I thought I was going to be a trader, you know, for a while. Okay. And, um, and, and they're like, oh, we love hockey players, love hockey players on the desk, you know, so, so, so yeah, I would imagine, I would imagine. See? So, yeah. Right. All over the resume, all over the resume. <laughs> That's right. Well, we're, we're, we're going to bounce around a lot because the resume, speaking of which, is 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 really impressive. So uh, one thing that you and I haven't talked about a lot, just a little bit, I, I know that there's a big background in food, but the food spa, was was that the juice bar that you started? Was that your first entrepreneurial venture or is there stuff even before that? Um. No, I think the first entrepreneurial thing was, um, uh, shit. Um, I, I, I mean, I did, you know, I, I grew up every summer, you know, do, do, do doing food, you know, and so my first entrepreneurial adventure was probably doing, you know, New England style clam bakes for people in people in, uh, in Newport. Yeah. You know, we used to go and put on a big show, create a big fire, you know, get the, uh, you know, the, the rocks that we'd wrap in foil and do a big, you know, big fire and a big bake kind of thing. Um, and it, where, where did that come from? Did your, did your mom, where'd that come from? Was, was, was that a, a family thing that you guys did? We didn't. There was a guy that um, I worked for a place called the Coast Guard House in, in, in Narragansett, Rhode Island. And okay. this guy, Chuck, I can't remember his last name. He was a re really talented chef. And so I actually created a, um, a, a raw bar with him at the Coast Guard house. And so I used to, you know, be up on the deck and used to shuck a thousand clams a day and oysters and boil a ton of shrimp. And so, so Chuck did these New England style clam bakes. So I really kind of learned from him. Okay. And I went off on my own and did a, did, did, did a few. I love it. I love it. And so, so where, where does, and I'm trying to think of like, like, like the calendar, where, where does the food spa pop into that? So the food spa uh, was kind of post 9-11. So I, um, you know, one of my first tech companies called Runtime, um, you know, we had, we were in the middle of raising money in 2000, you know, when the market crashed then. And, um, and you know, we had to let a bunch of people go at that point. And, uh, and I stepped out, you know, soon after. And then... Um, but what I do? So, so, so I went to, uh, I, I went and had a little vacation for a bit. And then when I came back, it was, uh, it was nine 11. And so I, uh, I moved out to the Hamptons at that point. And I was, um, just, you know, still taking a little bit of time off after the uh, runtime venture. And I started a, um, I was bartending and, um, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, I was looking to do <laughs> looking for another venture and I started a, a little juice bar that there's this guy, uh, Jeff, he had a place called Jeff's fancy produce. And it was in this, it wasn't even a building. It was really kind of a tent, you know, he, um, you know, had a canvas roof on the top of it. And, um, so I took it over, I fixed it up and, uh, put in a juice bar and, um, and sold a lot of produce, uh, you know, all the groceries were organic as much organic as possible. 
Yeah. And, yeah. um, and it was just a lot of fun. I mean, we'd have jams, you know, a couple times a week out in the courtyard and back of the place. And we'd play a lot of uh, shaggy all the time to get a, get a good vibe going on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you play it too? A little bit? A good run. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I was playing guitar then. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the thing that fascinates, fascinates me about all that and, and correct me if I get this wrong, but is, is that when you adopted an online ordering system already? Was that for food spa? Um, yeah, um, technically it was for BOGO food. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no way. So, you can't even make that up. <laughs> no, no. I love so, it. So the, um, the, the thing about this shack is that, you know, it was, you know, I couldn't run it in the winter. Right. Okay. So it was, um, so I had, you know, a lot of people that were, you know, really, I was trying to turn on to organic food. I mean, it's hard to imagine now, but there's a time when, you know, most, you know, the vast majority of people hadn't heard of the organic food. Yeah. And so yeah. it's kind of interesting that a lot of the people that were kind of converting were new moms, right? And they really came dependent upon what I was doing. I actually started, you know, selling diapers, which was the biggest thing that new moms were looking for, something that you know, diapers that weren't bleached and formula. Oh, okay. um, and uh, you know, baby food and, and, and those kinds of things that, uh, that new moms were looking for. So I started a, uh, a co-op. So, um, United food. So I used to buy through actually supports co-ops. And okay. so I figured out how to get them to support a co-op, even though I was a store. And, um, so I ran a, a co-op. So effectively people would order, you know, once a week and then they, their food would come, you know, a few days later. Okay. Um, and so I continued the co-op and the co-op got pretty big. I mean, I had on a 50 or 60 families, you know, that first year ordering from the co-op. Wow. Wow. And then when I decided to close down the food spa after a four or five year run, I really went online. I took the, the co-op concept and then I started, you know, stocking things. So the co-op is kind of a cool idea that it's a kind of just in time delivery. People order stuff and then it shows up a couple of days later. And so I kind of worked on that concept with, um, uh, with, with the groceries. So I didn't have to stock any, I would stock about a couple hundred items. And then all of the, um, uh, you know, the produce, uh, again, was all pre-ordered. So I didn't have any waste there. And so I had this really kind of fun concept because with, um, with, with, with United, you know, everything you have to order a case, right? So some moms just didn't want a case of diapers. Sure. Sure. So I created this thing called Splitsville <laughs> and in Splitsville, you could go and you could order, you know, just 12 diapers out of the case, but you wouldn't get it until another mom came and ordered the other 12. Grab the other 12. Yeah. And it could yeah. be two different parents might order six. And then when that got done, you'd send out an email to everyone and say, Hey, you, you, you're, you're getting diapers this week, you know, come down and grab it. So does this all still exist? I mean, you walked away from that, but did someone take that over or, uh, they didn't know that software is probably sitting in a box somewhere, but yeah. And somebody's going to grab it. Somebody's going to grab it. So what, what year are we now, John? Where, where, where are we? Um, so this probably is... 2005 at this point. And, and where does the, um, I'm going to segue to the, the wall street delivery service. Was that part of that? Or is that something that came after that? No, that came, that came way before actually. So oh, way was, before. Okay. Yeah, that was pretty much, um, right out of college. That was 1987. So talk about that a little bit. That was, that, that story is fascinating to me. You were taking other people's business away because you figured out a way to, give people what they wanted, right? On Wall Street. Uh, yeah, it was pretty cool. So, so it's really a couple of components. So one was uh, the company was called La Carte. There's this guy, Walter Greenblatt had started it. And um, so the concept was to send guys down in tuxedos, right? And take <laughs> orders from, uh, from the guys at their trading desks and then go back into the refrigerated truck, which is waiting downstairs, and they get all these little bento boxes, which, okay. were, which they then bring up. And so one of the things that um, 
that you know I helped innovate there was actually uh, the, the ordering system. So instead of having the guys in the tuxedos come up, which you know took a lot of time, we actually at Bear Stearns we actually uh, programmed the Quotrons so the guys could actually order you know right through the Quotron. Uh, it was kind of fun. Um, but the thing we learned pretty quickly is that the uh, you know traders are typically hockey players, right? Yeah. <laughs> You know, of course, bigger, stronger of course. guys. They were just not into the, you know, salmon <laughs> with sauce vert that we were <laughs> that we were serving them, and you know the nice little. We also sold these bento box meals in Bloomingdale's and you know a few okay. other retail outlets as well, and so we you know kind of innovated to setting up buffets uh, for them, and then they could come and you know kind of take what they wanted uh, from the buffets with more hearty food, and then that. Um, you know, I had a number of friends who were in investment banking, so I started selling to the investment bankers who got fed after eight o'clock. So most of them were in the evening, ordering from in the evening. Uh, Delmonico's okay. and other places downtown. Okay, okay, that they makes a, sense. Yeah, they had a twenty-eight dollar uh, budget actually if they stayed after eight o'clock. The okay that budget, and then so I you know went down and said, hey, you know, give me eighteen bucks. And I will reduce your security concerns of having all these delivery guys run around your halls and, uh, you know, set up a buffet for them every night. And we did that. I don't know. I think at Drexel, we were in a, um, in an elevator bay, you know, we kind of set it up there and guys would come <laughs> and, you know, for the most part that they, they, they loved it. It made, it made friends with the folks at Delmonico's, huh? <laughs> <laughs> no, they didn't like it too much. I, I imagine, right? They, they, they were kind of reeling. They really didn't get any warning at all. Yeah, I don't know where a competition. Yeah. So, so then fast forward. So, so you know, we cook together, and I, I mean, food is a big, important part of your life. And I and I love just the entrepreneurial spirit. We'll come back to this question again. Um, things you've learned um through through starting companies and changing companies and then starting new companies any any advice on what to do what not to do wow um well i mean i mean the first thing i'll say is that you know a lot of you know i think a lot of people plan and plan you know like right now i'm planning another venture you know around music and you know you can plan and plan but some of me feels like I need to go back to my old instincts and just kind of jump in and just start doing something, mm -hmm. you know, just start doing it. And I think a lot of, a lot of people out there will, will tell you that and just get a product out there, start getting some customer feedback. You know, it's like innovating from ordering from a Quotron to, uh, you know, give, giving guys a buffet, you know, that they were, that they were much happier with. And traders, by the way, the reason it worked is because they can't leave their desks. They don't yeah, go yeah. out for lunch. Sure, you know, they're sure. just there, you know, the whole time. Meet so them where they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we found a big business need and just kept listening until we, you know, found something that really worked and turned that into a, you know, multi-million dollar business. Um, so, so, so there's that. And then, you know, the other thing is just, you know, finding, really finding the right people to work with, finding people that kind of share the passion so that they share the passion for the, you know, for pleasing customers, for, for, you know, finding solutions. And that's a big, you know, that's a world of difference from people who are, you know, having to, having to pick themselves up, you know, to get into work every day, you know? So, so I generally always had passionate people and especially a production partner, you know, like with, um, you know, with, with, with the cart business, you know, I had Richie Jones, who, man, he could pump out some food. I mean, 5,000 <laughs> meals a day out of a 5,000 square foot commissary. Right? That's, that's we, cranking. That's cranking. We, yeah. We, 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 we didn't, we had the tiniest walk in. So we had the food come in fresh like three times a day. Because Un the unbelievable. Didn't have any walk in or freezer space. You know, wow. Wow. Finding other people that really have the passion for solving problems you know? is, is that the word passion is just so important right so no matter how cool the idea is or even lucrative the idea is right. in the absence of passion is it still interesting to me uh really not re really not so much and and by the way you know fear actually helps too yeah <laughs> 
<laughs> fear, uh, of, fear of putting some food on the table. Yeah, sure, uh, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So, so I think a combination of the two of those. Have been no, no, that's a good combination. Right. Yeah, you, you can see where I'm going with this too. The advice is really, really important. Sometimes those are the things that keep people from being successful, right? It's, there's no passion there, right? I'm not feeling it. And, um, and there's the fear of a failing, right? It's like, I'll just go work for someone because I'm too... I'm too terrified about failing, right? Yeah, and it, and I think it helps to like your customers, you know, to yeah. really feel to really feel the the need to, to 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 please people and to be able to get that that feedback that you're that you're really solving their problems and and you're really helping and that 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 that's been a big driver for me. I I love that, John. Um, this this idea of liking your customers. I'm going to, I'm always the marketer, right? I've got to connect that to Escoffier a little bit. That was something that Auguste Escoffier was known for, right? He, right? he he loved hospitality and he loved to serve. That was, you know, it was inherent to him. So, and that's the fun thing about retail, right? And, <clears throat> you know, I had never worked in retail before the food spa, but it was great just being at the, you know, being at the register or being at the, you know, making juices for folks and just yeah. getting, just getting instant feedback and, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I love that. I it's it's just amazing to me because I've known you for several years now, you know, and we hang and all that. And there's these little nuances that I did, you know, I just didn't even know about. I I absolutely yeah. love it. So, John, let's talk a little bit about your most recent company, um, Zingfit, which which um sold right before uh the pandemic and 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 you know the connection um you know, to your passion, uh, moving out of kind of the food centric, um, sort of spirit to this whole, uh, lifestyle company, right. Which Zingfit really was re, um, um, exercise, right. Uh, um, what, what was, what was the catalyst to that? How did that all come about? Um, well, first, I think it's useful to say that, you know, Zingfit, wasn't a you know lifestyle company but we were supporting lifestyle brands like, like, like soul cycle right okay so, okay. Been, so you know i was a techie you know since you know since since way back and um you know had done done some technical things so during you know while i was you know running the food spa which was a seasonal business right because we were in a shack right so <laughs> So during the winters, <laughs> you know, I would do some tech work for people. Okay. And um, so one of the things I, you know, learned to do was, you know, was, was web coding. And so, um, so I, I was, you know, web coding for a, a, a company out there. Um, and it was kind of a strange, um, kind of a strange, you know, a, a, a occurrence, but the soul site. So my commissary was in the bottom of a barn. And upstairs was a yoga studio and Soul Cycle, right? Soul Cycle was actually working out of a barn. Okay. I would be trying to take my trucks out and do my deliveries, and all these Range Rovers would be coming in at 60 miles an hour, you know, to try to make it to the Soul Cycle class, you know, kind of blocking <laughs> my drive. <laughs> and then, so, so strangely enough, they're also a client of the of, of the web um, company, and then. Um, you know, when they went, um, you know, when SoulCycle really started to ramp up, um, the, you know, the owner of that, um, you know, Gordon needed some help. And I brought in, you know, Jeremy Fersenbrom, who was, who was my partner, right? And Jeremy, I know from another life in the city. And so Jeremy uh, took over that company uh, that was making software for, for SoulCycle. Basically, okay. You know, re rewrote the, uh, you know, uh, rewrote the code. And then... Um, um, you know, I helped, uh, you know, Jeremy do a lot of the front end interfaces for, um, uh, for, for, for the studios, you know, and, and went out and, you know, was helping himself for a bit. So the, so Zingfit had, I think a dozen cycling studios as part of the business before I jumped on full time. So I was okay. still doing my other gigs. And then even when I jumped on, I think there was probably 50 cycling studios in the world at that point. But I had an idea again, because I had a sense of lifestyle, right? Okay. Okay. And, yeah. And just from, 
just from the food business, you know, they have this thing they call Lojas, which is lifestyle of health and sustainability. You've probably heard of that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Probably from you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's everything from yoga to organic and everything. And so from that, I understood lifestyle and I, I thought of, uh, you know, soul cycle and Barry's Boot Camp, who is our probably number eight, you know, customer. I really thought of them as, um, as lifestyle businesses. And I thought because of that lifestyle, that boutique fitness would grow rapidly because I, th I thought that they had lifestyle right and the timing was right about it. Okay. So I jumped on the software company to, to help enable that. Yeah. Do, do you see any parallels between, uh, gosh, your, your background in the, in, in the tech space is amazing. Do you see parallels between this this adoption i'm gonna get the words wrong whether it's software or just technology innovation in the food industry versus or and in the uh in the fitness industry um yeah i i, I again i think that people people that eat organic food right uh, 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 adopt a lifestyle you know I think sure. there's a lifestyle around barbecue. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I think there's a lifestyle probably around, you know, pasta and red sauce. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. And, and, yeah. And, and, and I think that that fits, you know, the lifestyles about how people gather um, and how people socialize. And so I think the real connection is, 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 is social. So, you know, food is a highly social thing whether yeah. it be, you know, around our kitchen table, whether we're being in the restaurant, whether we're eating, uh, you know, in, in, in the park for, for, for Shakespeare, you know, for Shakespeare sure, concert. sure, you know, it's all social and boutique fitness is a really highly social thing. People come to work out, but also to be seen. Yeah. You know? yeah. And, and, yeah. And even a lot of the, um, a lot of uh, our studios ended up implementing, you know, juice bars and, you know, tea and coffee so people could hang out and congregate and, you know, create a courtyard, you know, kind of for congregation before and after. So, yeah, be beautifully said, said like an educator, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Speaking of education, let, let's talk a little bit of education. Another part of your amazing resume, right? You, you, uh, you were actually a teacher for a little while, right? Was that right out of college or is that after food spa? Uh you know, that really kind of came out of my, I did, you know, when I left La Carte, you know, the, 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 the business, I, I was just really passionate about environmental issues and I went to work for Greenpeace for a bit. So I was working on the, um, on the solid waste campaign. And, um, you know, my focus was on, was on incinerators and, you know, almost kind of ended my life ending incinerators, but <laughs> 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 so I went into teaching. And so okay, I taught um, okay. at a, a at a private school on, on Long Island called called Friends Academy, and I taught there for a couple of years, and then I uh, taught at the Dalton School in New York City for a couple of years, and and, and that um, yeah, and, and then ironically, Jeremy also taught at the Dalton School, and so we, you know, so so the technology heritage there and how I get into technology is uh you know Bob Tishman gave uh, Wesleyan five uh, gave um. A Dalton $5 million to experiment with technology in the classroom. So that's really kind of where my tech chops, you know, began and how I kind of transitioned from education to technology. Cause I was just so fascinated with the stuff that we were doing. Yeah. It, amazing stories. And I, and I, my mind's going a million miles an hour. Cause when I think about, you know, I've been in, in, in the food business for, for, and the education business for a long, long, long time. And I never thought you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that we could create a platform where we could reach people from, you know, coast to coast and help them better understand and learn how to cook uh, and prepare for the industry. I mean, who would have thought that we could do that? Uh, it, they they this... don't seem to go together, right? The idea yeah, of yeah. in front and, of a screen, right? But, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I guess and, Julia changed all that, right? Yeah, well, she certainly had a lot to do with that, right? Yeah. So it's it's fascinating. Um, this concept that digital marketing. What talk to me about digital marketing? What does that mean to you? Um, 
Well, it means a huge amount now. I mean, it, it, at that point, it was really just about helping, you know, through my own work of doing SEO, you know, search engine optimization. I, I helped other folks do that. And then um, I was also helping people. I mean, this is this is kind of early. This is this is 80s, you know, but, um, you know, there, there weren't a lot of tools out there. There was no social media. Yeah, um, so the other yeah. thing was really buying, uh, you know, bu buying Google ads. So I'd help uh, people buy Google ads and I worked with some agencies who, who did that. From, and, from a, and again, that was my, you know, that was kind of my winter work. You okay. Know, I was, uh, <laughs> then back to the shack or <laughs> back to yeah. the shack. <laughs> <laughs> yep. shaggy in the shack. Yeah. yeah i'm not i'm not gonna let that one go i love that <laughs> i love that story For, you know from a from a timing perspective again um right before the pandemic um uh, what, what what what's kept you busy over the i i see a keyboard just barely right there and a you know, pretty impressive microphone what's kept you busy over the the last 18 months um you know so those are the the there was a bit of a, you know, transition, you know, after we, after we sold the company. And then when, um, you know, really just before, just before COVID, you know, the acquirers, you know, took over and, uh, and, you know, Jeremy and I stepped out and, you know, a lot of the other um, founders stepped out as well. Um, they, they bought five uh, companies in, 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 in the boutique fitness business. Um, and then, uh, you know, things were really on lockdown. So I, you know, sure. I keep this, I keep this bucket list on my, uh, on, on my, uh, my iPhone. And so I just pick something from the bucket list. I, I, you know, always, I mean, I play guitar, I sing a little bit, but I've always wanted to play the piano. And, you know, it's a particular challenge for me because I'm so uncoordinated in terms of using both hands. And it's, you know, <laughs> it took me a while, you know, on, on the guitar. So it, it, it seemed like a good challenge. And, you know, my daughter was taking, she used to take in-person lessons that moved to Zoom and she had a really cool instructor, this guy, Adam Coleman. And so I asked him if, if, if he would teach me. And uh, so he, you know, he, he, he started teaching me. And I guess even before that, you know, I, 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 uh, I, I, I learned Piano Man note for note using YouTube. <laughs> Isn't that something? And, see, and I, see I, how you can I, learn online. It's amazing. And I just slog <laughs> through it for like two months. It's so much so that I can't play it in the house because my kids will kill me. <laughs> well, the kids are in school right now, no, so not so. Piano man again. Let's 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 hear a little piano man. No. Oh, I don't know if I remember it. You know, it's like um. It's been a while. See, I love it. I love it. it with both hands, with both <laughs> hands. I, I, I love it. So, so music though, again, passion, right. Is that, uh, you told me once that, that you, you went to France and, and, and played the guitar. Now I'm probably exaggerating a little bit, but what, what were you doing? Were you in France for food? Were you in France for business or were you in France to play the guitar? Oh my God. It, it, it's, <laughs> <laughs> um, some point it gets almost embarrassing as I kind of move from passion to passion, but you know, it is what it is. So, so this is really after, after runtime. So after I stepped out of there, you know, and just before nine 11, I just needed a break, you know, I'd been, yeah, yeah, been yeah. working at this company for, for a while, you know, we grew it to, I don't know, be a few million dollar business. And, um, so, so, so I just stepped out and I wanted to, you know, I left food at some point, you know, to, for, for technology. And, um, you know, I wanted to go back for it for a while. So I said, you know, really, what better thing than to go to France and just work as a sous chef? See, and just, see, and just try to find a job. So I did some networking. Um, you know, one of my um, friends, one of my artist friends in New York um, lived in this tiny little town called Pézenas in the south of France, uh, where very few people speak English. And I, you know, I studied a little French in school and uh, studied in, in Geneva for, for a semester. So I had some French under my belt and I just, um, and, and I just went for it. So I worked in this uh, tiny little restaurant, you know, making some food and managed not to get myself killed with my French in the kitchen. 
<laughs> we chef, we chef. <laughs> and, and then, you know, when I was there, the, uh, the work police ended up, uh, you know, come, coming to get me and uh, okay. so I had to stop <laughs> and so I had to make a living and, you know, I had, I had my, my guitar there and I, you know, wasn't great on it. I'm a, you know, I'm okay at the guitar. I'm okay at singing. But people there love the fact that I pronounce the English words correctly. Like I play the Beatles and people would go nuts. (laughs) (laughs) Who knew? Who knew? I I, I did a lot of Elvis. People would go nuts, you know. Since my baby left me. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. So so are we um, are we parlaying that passion for music into any future projects that we can talk about Mm, just a little bit (laughs) (laughs) stay Um, tuned right yeah you know i i did you know before i started taking lessons um you know i was uh, i I learned a you know a few tunes on on youtube and 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 i think youtube is a really great thing there's all these you know content creators as they call them out there helping people and, you know, they're making the money through ads, you know, which are really, really annoying. And now very few of them are making money on ads anymore. You know, Google's taking, t- 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 taking all the money. And so there's other kind of platforms that people are using now to try to get tips or they're doing uh, a lot of product promotion. Oh, by the way, this is the guitar I'm playing. You can buy it on sweetwater.com, you know? Yeah, yeah <laughs> and, sure, uh, sure. It's yeah. a lot of that stuff. And then it's really just hard to find content. So I've been yeah. kind of working on trying to, you know, better monetization model, um, making better curation. You know, it's really difficult to find stuff on YouTube that is in the genre or at the level, you know, that, that you want or that, you know, where, where you are. Yeah. So, um, yeah. you know, a lot of the traditional music schools are kind of good at that of saying, okay, you're at this level. Um, but you shouldn't have to be stuck at that level either. You know, you should be able to move to something kind of, kind of more, more complicated, you know? Sure. So, sure. Sure. Um, yeah. So, so that's, so that's the next thing it's called, it'll be called raves. That'll be the name of it. Okay. So, so you're down a path. You're down a uh, path. You, you get, you're ideating, you're going. <laughs> yeah. I was working pretty hard on it. And then we kind of got in the, you know, got in the trailer for six weeks and yeah. kind of let my mind go free. And now I'm, <laughs> Now I'm kind of back at the piano and back kind of thinking about, uh, thinking about raves. But you took your music with you on the road too, right? As I understand. Uh, I, I did. Yeah. Much the annoying <laughs> to my family. I had a little, a uh, little battery powered uh, keyboard. <laughs> keep the passion, keep the passion going. Hey, so we're getting, we're getting a little close to the end, uh, um, of our time together. I'm, I'm going to have you come back at, uh, some later dates. Some, so many great conversations. We'll maybe we'll play a little bit more music. But uh, I love the background for this. So the name of the podcast, uh, John, is The Ultimate Dish. So in your mind, and you've got a lot of thoughts, what is The Ultimate Dish? Oh, oh there's so many. Um, um, so it's really two things. One is chicken soup. <laughs> I make a really good chicken soup, and it's really the one thing that the kids get really, really excited about. Okay. And it's, and it's really from, from my mom and she got my son, Leo eating chicken soup so that my mom's nickname is grandma chicken soup. Grandma. <laughs> so I, I didn't know that. On... I didn't know that. Oh my God. Yeah. And so I've pretty worked pretty hard at replicating her, 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 her recipe. Everyone loves chicken soup. Yeah. It's it, it warms the soul, right? It's perfect. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, What's number two? Um, number two is this dish I learned how to make in, in, in Pezenas. And it's this, um, it's this muscle dish, you know, really made, um, with a, um, with a seafood stock and roasted red peppers, you know, together. I forget the name of it. I think it's pretty classic. And, uh, and, and you serve, uh, and you serve mussels, um, on top of it. For with mou, fresh bread. And I, I think it's yeah. mou, mou, mou marinier or something like that. Mou, yeah. Marinier. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds right. And and it takes you there, right? I could, I, I could, I'm there just hearing it, right? Oh my God. Just, and you dip the bread into the broth and oh yeah. 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 Very, very my, nice. Uh, well, it's actually, it's actually not even a broth. It is a, 
it, it, it's really just a, a red pepper puree. Oh, okay. With seafood stock in it. Yeah, just, yeah. Uh, and, and then all the um, uh, all the broth from the mussels when you put it on it actually sure. kind of drizzles and makes these rivers. Yeah, in the, in, in the red pepper puree. In the it's pepper really, sauce. Really yeah, sublime. yeah. Beautiful, so, beautiful. But you're yeah. right. That one, that one really takes me back there. That's nice. Yeah, that's that's a good memory. I think maybe what we should do at some point is, I'm thinking we we should write a sitcom. You and me. <laughs> I I even have a name. I have a name. I'm gonna write it, but but we can't share that name. Today. Oh, you can't expose that yet? No. It, not yet. Not yet, buddy. <laughs> yeah, maybe, hey. maybe, maybe we can work up a bit for the next time. Let, let's do that. Yeah. Oh, we could do, this could be a, a different podcast. Yeah. Why not? Right. There you go. Bogo, thanks for being with us today, man. I love you. And uh, yeah, best yeah. wishes always. I'm going to bring you back. Okay. Uh, bring me back. Yeah. To the podcast. Oh, okay. I got <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for, th thanks for sorting through my, uh, my, uh, my, 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 my crazy twisted life. No, but it's, it's a fascinating yeah, story. Journey. You're a storyteller, right? And uh, and you have a great story to tell, and I love it. And lots lots of beautiful lessons about passion, and and uh, and I, I think you said at the beginning of the podcast, just do something, just do something, just start something, right? Yeah, and 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 you can, you know. Yeah, I think there's sure this, there, there's this big fear, but I think if there's enough there, you'll kind of figure out how to make it work. You know, you'll you know you don't have to go out and raise money. You know, you just have to find customers. Yeah. And, then, and, and, and then find a partner, you know, because there's the, the, the energy doesn't last, you know, and you need someone to basically, you know, be able to pick it up when you've, when you've kind of had enough too. So yeah. you know, find, f f find someone who has, you know, some sort of skills that aren't, aren't doing what you're doing, but that, that, but, but that works. And like, and, and like your customers, like, like your, your customers. customers yeah. Yeah, yeah the even best if you have advice. To bite your lip a couple times. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Thank you again. Appreciate right. it. Thanks for Good being with you. us. Thank you for listening to the Ultimate Dish Podcast, brought to you by Auguste Escoffier School of Culinary Arts. Visit escoffier.edu forward slash podcast, where you'll find any materials mentioned during the podcast, including notes, links, and other resources. You can also browse other episodes and subscribe.